Hello Internet, it's S. Gorkowski, and today we'll be discussing the classic, the legendary, Dungeons & Dragons adventure, Ravenloft. Written by Tracy and Laura Hickman and published in 1983 by TSR, the adventure was a monumental hit. It spawned a sequel, The House on Griffin Hill. It's been revisited, updated, and reimagined, beginning with the second edition campaign setting, then third, and then most recently in fifth edition's Curse of Strahd. There's been a box set, numerous module adventures, and add-on accessories. We've had novels, video games, and even a board game, and it all originated from this 32-page adventure. Pretty impressive. Instead of the many other adventures coming out at the time, Ravenloft created and revolved around a story of Strahd Bonzorovich, uh, not only a great villain, but a character that moved around during the game and had a lot of depth. Excuse me, but I think what you mean to say is the Devil Strahd. <coughs> Ravenloft also went against the classic Tolkien-esque backdrop that D&D settings at the time had by using gothic horror instead, which showed the versatility of the game being able to do lots of different themes. While an original printing with the fold-out maps will run you 40 bucks or more on eBay, you can find a very good PDF and print-on-demand version on DriveThruRPG. Now, for the sake of full disclosure, DriveThruRPG sent me copies of both the PDF and the print-on-demand for this to use in this review. So a huge thank you to them. I have links down below in case you decide that you want to pick one up. Also, being such an old module that's been around for so long and has been updated for a new generation of players to play, it has something that only a few cherished old modules have, and that is uh, shared war stories. I can go to a game shop or an online chat or go to a convention and I can meet people there. And even though we have never spoken before, we can sit down and we can chat and reminisce about the time that we went through this adventure. And that's a very rare thing that you can do that crosses different generations and different ages. And it's only possible with old adventures like this. So a huge thank you to Wizards of the Coast for keeping Ravenloft alive and available for a new generation of players to enjoy. So today we're going to talk about the adventure, criticisms and tips and suggestions on how to run it. Now, because there are so many versions of this adventure out there, I am only going to discuss the original first edition module I-6. Yes, a lot of it can be used in later editions, and I'm even going to discuss some of the later editions a little bit, but for today's review, we're only going to talk about what is between the pages of the original first edition module. Now, needless to say, there will be spoilers. So for any players in the audience, if you want to experience Ravenloft, you should stop now, but send your Dungeon Master this way. Alrighty DMs, let's dive in. Starting with one of Ravenloft's coolest features, the maps. It comes with a fold-out map of Baravia, as well as two of Castle Ravenloft, which is isometric, giving it a 3D look. The PDF versions of these, which I used for my slides, are huge, running about 2,000 by 3,000 pixels in size. The new print-on-demand does come with color maps, however, because they've added it to the book binding, you can't see the middle portion of it, which is extremely unfortunate in an otherwise wonderful printing of the original module. So I suggest that anyone that decides to pick up the print-on-demand also go ahead and pick up the PDF version as well, that way they can get to those very high-resolution color maps. Also on the PDF, it is searchable, so you can go through and search for certain phrases or anything, and that makes it very useful for GMs to use. The only complaint that I have about the maps themselves is that the length of them makes them a bit difficult to use behind the Game Master screen. Uh, GMs can find different renditions online or with the new editions, but the original castle map I find perfect. The overland map, not so much. I like the color-coded elevation, but the location markers make it useless for me to give to my players. Once again, there are other versions out there, including the 5th edition one, which does show a much larger area than the original map. So DMs could use this, or they could just take that and then crop it down to the original area. The interior art is all very good. But since there are so many additions and expansions over the years, I suggest that Dungeon Masters look for more than just the module's black and white illustrations in order to help them imagine and describe the scenery even better. 
Personally, I prefer the fantasy look that 5th edition gave Strahd over the 1st edition Bela Lugosi's Dracula depiction. The adventure says that it's meant for 6 to 8 characters level 5 through 7. Now that's a good sized group, but I'm going to suggest that your players be in the upper 6th to 7th level range on average, and I strongly encourage you to have at least one cleric. The module says that all you need is a fighter who uses a long sword, but I completely disagree with that. You can make the sun sword whatever type of sword your players use. So it can be a short sword, or a scimitar, or a rapier, or a two-hander, or whatever. Hell, you can even make it an axe or a hammer. Whatever it is your players use, you can just give that the sun sword abilities and just go forward from there. The module opens with the PCs in a tavern, and a gypsy walks in, bringing them a letter and a plea for help. Hail to thee of might and valor. This letter is definitely talking about me. Come on, guys, we're going to Baravia. There's a damsel in distress, evil to be killed, and a ton of treasure to boot. Game masters can simply read them the letter, which is boring, or print it out and hand it to them. But there's also much nicer ones out there that you can find that have a much better look. For my game, I wrote it out myself on thick resume paper, then I sealed it with wax. Personally, I am a handout game master, so I think that physical props really do help with player immersion. Once the PCs have provisioned up and have arrived at the gates of Baravia, that's when the real adventure begins. The area is shrouded in a thick fog and the gates open as they near. Because Ravenloft is a mood game, and while this might sound a little bit cheesy, I suggest that you employ some moody theatrics for it. So turn the lights down a little bit low, you know, still, you know, where they can still read everything, and maybe employ some electric candles for some flickering mood lighting, and also add some mood music, such as the Dracula soundtrack or Nox Arcana's Transylvania. The eternal fog that's around Baravia is magical, and anyone that tries to leave, it becomes poisonous and kills them, and I really don't like that aspect to it. Personally, I prefer the idea that anyone who tries to leave suddenly gets kind of completely shrouded in the fog, and then when they step out of it again, they're either where they started, or maybe you put them on the opposite side of the map. And I think that gets a little bit more of a magical and gothic feel to it than just saying, ooh, poison fog. Now the gypsies can leave because they have access to a magic potion that they employ, but I suggest that you change that from being a magic potion to like a magic candle, and they put the candle in a lamp, and that lights their way through this fog that no one else can pass through. PCs that explore the woods are going to find a dead body after three rounds, but nothing sends them into the woods to begin with. So you should have your PCs either smell the body, or maybe see some wolves and buzzards that are hopping around something and they can't make out what it is, and maybe their claws are dinging off of a helmet or some metal armor and they can hear the dinging, but you need to give the PCs a reason to explore the woods. On the body they'll discover a second letter, this one being just a little bit different than the one that they already received. Again, I urge you to give them a physical letter. However, the module split the one that they did over two pages, so simply printing it isn't as nice. But as before, there are prettier ones that you can find and print. For my game, I wrote the second letter, and this one on a paper from a Manila envelope, so that way it was a little bit more crumpled and a little bit browner. I also used a different handwriting so my players could see the difference rather than just telling them that they were different. Okay guys, this letter clearly states vampire. And I don't mean a vampire with an I. I'm talking about a vampire with a Y, which means we're not gonna be able to kick its ass that easy. So I say we go ahead and we tuck out of here, maybe gain a few levels, come back with like a keg of holy water and about 17 more clerics. Let's get out of here. Okay, how the hell did we end up back here? It's like we can't escape and Oh, holy crap, this is going to be bad. Eventually the PCs will enter the village of Baravia, and I have a few suggestions for it. First, the village doesn't present itself at all like a community that's been oppressed by a vampire over the course of centuries. They need to have a wall around it, maybe give it signs that that wall has been built up and knocked down and rebuilt, and the wall that they have now is, you know, kind of a mishmash of old wall and new wall and kind of everything in between. The houses themselves need to be fortified with thick walls and heavy doors that have silver studs across them. Make it more like the village at the beginning of Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust where every rooftop sported this huge cross and they lived in the shadow of the vampire's castle. So you should put holy symbols on the top of every building in this town. 
Every night, one hour before sunset, the church bell should start ringing, and that's what summons everyone to go in from the fields or wherever they are and get inside and lock the doors. The module says that the church bell hasn't been rung in years, but why wouldn't it be? They need to be signaling everybody any time there is some sort of a potential that a monster might come. So keep the church bell an active part of the community and have the players notice this because this is kind of unique for any other town that they've been in. Now, some reviewers that I've read have had a certain problem with the fact that the tavern and the mercantile in town still have inventory. And they're like, why would this town still have inventory there? Because they've been cut off for centuries. And to me, that really just shows a lack of imagination on those reviewers' parts. After all, the module specifically states that the tavern is owned by gypsies, and it specifically states that the gypsies can leave the fog whenever they want. So where does all the food and the inventory come from? I don't know, maybe they left and got it. Also, new people that come wandering in town shouldn't be all that uncommon. Uh, you could say it's either because they got lost and they took the wrong road and they just kind of wandered into Bravia and now they can't leave, or you can say that the gypsies occasionally go outside the fog and they change street signs and road signs and it sends people into Bravia. That way they get some fresh blood for their gene pool and for the vampires. You could even have someone in town tell the player characters the story about how a long time ago a traveling circus kind of came wandering into Bravia and set up and they couldn't leave. So they had this circus in town for quite a while and it had, you know, elephants and lions and acrobats and all that stuff. And then eventually the circus just sort of disbanded and all the performers just kind of joined into the populace of Bravia. But everybody likes to remember that time back when Grandpa talked about that they used to have a circus. Essentially, don't think of Baravia as an island. Think of it more like a roach motel or the Hotel California. You can check in, but you can never leave. Another thing to keep in mind at all times is the cemetery. Every night at midnight, 100 ghosts rise up and march to the castle. Inside, they head straight to the chapel, then up the stairs of a high tower to where they then throw themselves down the shaft to the crypt beneath. This is awesome, but the module sort of glosses past it, and a GM might forget that this is a regular occurrence in this town. So have your players see it. Know that they're going to be where they are every night, because you know at midnight, this march is going to go right across the entire map of Baravia, and the PCs are probably going to encounter it. Now, since these are all the spirits of dead adventurers who tried to kill Strahd, maybe have the villagers say stuff like, you tried to kill the devil Strahd, and you'll end up in the Parade of the Fallen. I prefer calling it the Machi Heroes myself. But also, you forgot to spit after you said the devil Strahd. But the biggest suggestion that I have for the village is to draw it out. Let the PCs explore and interact with everybody that's in town and kind of give it a mood. Remember, this is a mood game, so have fun role-playing it up with the villagers and give the PCs that sort of sense of hopelessness and dread that everyone here feels. Also, tell them the lore about Straw. Maybe give them a little bit of history and rumors that they know, something about you know, some tragedy and maybe his lost love. Have the PCs hear these stories and definitely have an NPC tell the PCs that they should go visit Madam Eva. She is an important aspect of this game. However, the module sort of leaves bumping into her and the gypsy camp more up to chance than anything else. So either have a village tell, villager tell them that they need to go meet her, or just move the camp around, that way the PCs encounter it. After all, it's a gypsy camp and it's mobile. Once they find her, the players can participate in the fortunes of Ravenloft, which to me is one of the coolest aspects of this game. Essentially, through drawing cards, the players determine several key points about this adventure, such as where important items are located and what Strahd's motivation is. Now, of course, if a dungeon master doesn't like a certain result, they can either stack the deck in their favor, or they can just read the card description that they want versus the card description that came up. It's completely up to them. And while you can use standard playing cards for this, you can also use tarot cards for it. Or, 5th edition has a special Taroka deck that you can pick up and use those. Eventually the PCs will make their way to the castle to face their enemy. There is a whole lot of good stuff here. Much of it I like, but some of it I don't. Oh my god, like the puns in the crypt. Here we are in the perfect haunted castle scenario, and nothing ruins the mood faster than a bunch of stupid puns. It's like the devil straw, lord of darkness, and dad jokes. The random encounters here are a bit overly random. 
such as we can encounter enraged villagers, but how did they get in here? Because if the gates are closed after the PCs have entered, and if they got here before the PCs arrived, wouldn't there have been signs that a mob had passed through? Other encounters include rust monsters. Why would there be rust monsters wandering around in the castle? How are all these empty suits of armor and door hinges and everything else that's metal still here if there's wild rust monsters running around? Also, many of these encounters are level-draining monsters. Now, I've never been a big fan of level drains, but 2 to 16 whites or 2 to 12 wraiths seems a little high, and this can have a serious chance of either wiping out the party or making them too weak to face their opponent at the end. Once again, this is an adventure made for 5th through 7th level, and it just seems a bit much to be throwing at them, especially since the module doesn't state that you need to have a cleric. Next, in the brazier room, I like the puzzle for opening the door. However, the two iron golems against the party seems a bit much. Yeah, they only attack for 5 rounds, but 5 rounds with 2 creatures that do 4 die 10 a hit can take out a party extremely fast. This ended up being one of the hardest rooms for my players, and I suggest animating only one golem at a time, or maybe you uh, have one golem pop up the first time, and if they haven't solved it after the five rounds, then the second golem attacks them as well. But don't throw the second golem at them with the first one immediately in there, because that can wipe out your party when really they should just be enjoying the puzzle itself. And once again, why in the hell do you have rust monsters just running loose in a place where there's also iron golems that are supposed to be protecting your treasure? One very important thing to consider is that Strahd isn't your garden variety villain. He's a super villain, has a lot of potential to becoming a recurring enemy. The PCs don't actually have to kill him in order to win the adventure. They just have to defeat him and remove the curse from Boravia. So, with that in mind, let's discuss the floating heart. The Guardian of Sorrow isn't explained, other than the Guardian of Sorrow is the tower itself and the heart is the tower's heart. I think it's a cool idea, but it doesn't make any sense. Now, 5th edition made this sort of a damage absorber for Strahd, which is much better. But what if the heart is what's powering the magic fog? So destroying the heart destroys the fog, which lifts the curse above Boravia. Now, if you think that's a little bit too easy for the PCs just to simply walk into the castle and destroy the heart and the curse is lifted, then you can make it a two-part problem. You could say that destroying the heart destroys it until sunrise the next day, but the only way to truly destroy it is to use the sun sword. And then you can add that little detail into the Tome of Straw. That way, once the PCs find it and they read the book, they can learn how to lift the curse. Now, of course, destroying the heart before they've defeated Strahd will still require that the PCs manage to escape the castle and Strahd's wrath, because it's going to be guaranteed he's going to be gunning for him after that. But if Strahd decides that he can't beat the PCs, and he is smart enough to realize that if he is outmatched, he could go ahead and leave the area, and then the PCs are just can find the book, and they can destroy the heart and win the adventure. Now, one thing that I've read a lot of reviewer hate on is the comment that Strahd must be played like a PC. Reviewers claim that this gives Dungeon Masters full license to play against the players, you know, even bending rules or using out-of-character knowledge in order to keep Strahd alive. Now, I already have a video that I've done about GM versus player mentality and why that's a bad idea, so I think that's pretty well known. However, I don't see this as an excuse for being combative with your players. The module is simply telling Dungeon Masters to play Strahd intelligently and to be familiar with all of his capabilities, his powers, and his spells, just the same way that a player character or a player should be familiar with their character's abilities. Remember, at the time this module came out, having a villain that could move around and was smart and scheming was almost unheard of. Usually they just sat in the final room of the dungeon just waiting for the PCs to show up and kill them. And I highly doubt that a dungeon master that's been very good about not playing just directly against their players is going to see that line of the module and suddenly be all like, wow, well this changes everything, and just transform into a bad game master. The module is simply stating that Strahd is intelligent and should be played intelligently, and not like some generic bad guy that doesn't appear until the very end. And another source of viewer hate is the optional ending, where the ghosts of Sergei and Tatiana get back together. And there's a few reasons for that. 
One, some people seem to think that it turns the game to being about the NPCs rather than the PCs, and it's more about the Dungeon Master's story than the player character's story. But sometimes an adventure story isn't about the hero of the adventure getting the girl. It's about them reuniting other lovers. That's like a good third of the A-Team's episodes. It's also just like Big Trouble in Little China. In that, Jack Burton was reuniting his buddy and his buddy's girl. All he wanted for himself was to get his truck back so he could leave town. This is just like the player characters here, except their pork chop express is the fog that's keeping them into Baravia, and in order to get out of town, they first have to kill an evil, deathless wizard. But the big thing that these reviewers seem to forget is that it's optional. If your game hasn't been laying down the foundation and the history of the Devil Strahd's tragic backstory dealing with his brother and all that stuff, then yeah, the ending is going to feel like it comes out of nowhere and your players aren't really going to care about it. And if you approach this game like you would a standard D&D adventure dungeon crawl, I'd recommend that you probably don't do it. But these reviewers don't like the ending, and you know what? That's cool. Everybody likes to play the game a little bit differently, and that is fine. However, the amount of hate that they give this optional ending is exact same as those guy that's on a diet, you know, and he goes to a restaurant, and at the end of the meal, the server's like, hey, can I interest you in a dessert? And the person's not like, oh, no, thank you. I'm not interested, but other people can have a dessert. No, they're like, how dare you offer me a dessert? Don't you know that I'm on a diet? So yeah, the people that are so venomous about this optional ending are the exact same types of people that go to the Cheesecake Factory and leave it a one-star review because they offered them a freaking cheesecake. Overall, despite my complaints and all the areas that I think a Dungeon Master should make a few changes, I think that Ravenloft is a wonderful module and I highly recommend that you check it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the review, please give it a like. If you want to see some more of our other reviews and videos, just hit that little subscribe button. But until next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, some cheesecake and big trouble in Little China sounds like a really good combination right now.